Perfect. I think we're live. Um, so thank you everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Jan. I'm the founder and group CEO of U+. Plus. Uh, U+ Plus is an end-to-end -end innovation delivery leader. Um, over the past uh, 10 years, we've brought over 120 businesses to market, $2 billion in market value. Our team has managed over six funds, $100 billion in investments. And this is our first attempt uh, at a new format um, that we call the Art of Failing Up, uh, which, of course, as you're building new businesses, as you're working in innovation, um, uh, there's there's a lot of perils that you need to overcome um, and keep uh, keep resilient. And the, uh, the, the Failing Up really inspiration where it came from is there's a book from uh, Leslie Odom Jr., who was the actor for uh, Aaron Burr in the musical Hamilton, and he had a really good book about what he had to do to uh, what is his journey to get kind of to to that stage. And today, um, I'm, I'm pleased to welcome Martin Gonzalez, uh, who has become a friend after I asked a bunch of really annoying questions <laughs> a couple of years back in Sweden uh, when he was training me as a Google um, uh, Google mentor uh, for for leadership. And uh, just a bit of information about Martin. Uh, Martin currently works in organizational development at Google. Um, he works with research, technology, society, as well as devices, services, platforms, and ecosystems. Uh, he is the lead of the Effective Founders Project at Google for Startups, using people analytics to understand what makes the best startup founders succeed and sharing their success formula with the world. He's also writing a book on the very same topic. And before joining Google, he was a consultant at BCG and worked in product management at Johnson & Johnson. Uh, in addition to his Google work and the book, Martin is a lecturer at Stanford University, teaching courses on scaling organizational culture in startups and organizational design analytics. He's a frequent guest lecturer at uh, Graduate School of Business and is, a passionate, and is passionate about sharing his knowledge and insights with the next generation of innovators. I love talking to Martin because he's always very patient and explains uh, whenever I have annoying questions, he explains and we have really good discussions. So uh, I know, Martin, uh, you have some disclosures uh, to do before we yeah. can start. So let's do them now. Well, well, uh, just the first thing to say is I am thrilled to be here. And I agree that we have really fun conversations. Um, and I just want to say to everyone, I am here on my own personal account. Everything I say is only my own opinion and not of my employer. Perfect. Thank you. So... Uh uh, so the format uh, that we have is uh, it's going to be a fun one. Uh, we each prepared a bunch of questions, uh, generally around uh, either uh, either one of us, but uh, but mostly around uh, I think innovation and um, and and the future. We haven't shown each other those questions, um, and we'll see how many we can get through. Um, uh, I'm going to start with the first one, and at about forty minutes uh, time, uh, we'll open it up for questions. Um, from from uh, all of you, so feel free to send comments um, as you're as you're watching on LinkedIn Live. We're gonna see it, and then we're gonna get to those questions at the very end. So, ready? Great. Hit me. <laughs> Perfect. First question, Martin. Uh, this is the easy one. Uh, can okay. you tell? Can you tell us where? So you were born in the Philippines. You then moved to Singapore. Now live. Now you live in Silicon Valley. Like that's not an easy journey, right? And uh, I'm really curious, well, like, why and how? And uh, <laughs> if somebody wants to follow in your footsteps, how, how can how can they do that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I really left. I left the Philippines at about age 29 um, to do grad school. I, I think there was a sense, like a lot of folks who grew up in the Philippines, I guess, at some point, dreamt of dreams of of leaving and and doing something outside of the Philippines. I guess for me, it it wasn't, it, it was a dream, but I wasn't dead set on it. I, I knew I wanted to study. Um, and at that point in my family, um, doing an MBA was kind of the assumed path. Um, I was in business, I was doing marketing at Johnson & Johnson in the Philippines. Um, and, you know, something to understand when you're in marketing and consumer goods, you're kind of the king of the hill. You're You're the center of, of of the you're like the mini CEO of your product, R and D plugs into you, sales plugs into you. And you're you're kind of you're kind of the the it. And so I told my dad, um, 
I can't imagine anything more boring than doing an MBA. So could I maybe <laughs> pursue something that I was personally passionate about, which was this field of like leadership and organization um, development um, all, all the way up to that time while I was holding down this business job, I was doing like side gigs um, in a look with my local community, with clubs at school, like doing, doing leadership development. So I thought, let's see, let's, let's try. Um, at that point in time, a lot of the known leadership development uh, gurus, if you will, um, a lot of them were really big names, were already big names before they went into the work. Um, some were celebrities, some were kind of connected to celebrities. So I wasn't quite sure that there was a career path for me. But I thought, you know what, I have this opportunity. Let's just do something that could be, you know, fun. Um, so I went to grad school in New York. And somehow I my eyes were open to just what it meant to study something that you cared so deeply about. Um, and ever since then, I always dreamt of going back to school, doing a doctorate at some point. Who knows if I finally do it? Um, but that was really the start of the journey. But I want to say very quickly that I graduated from my first my, my first master's program um, in 2011, and the economy was barely recovering. And I could I couldn't find I couldn't find a job um, in the U.S. or I couldn't find it quickly enough. I should say. Um, the goal was to eventually stay in the U.S. after grad school, but I had to take a detour. I came back to Asia because that's where the jobs were. Um, and this is maybe the one thing I tell graduates during this time. We're kind of in graduation season. Um, it's so important to be flexible. And if you had a choice between the right job, the right location, and the right company, if that's that tends to be the criteria. I tend to find that choosing the right company over the right job or location seems to be a really good formula. Again, we're assuming you're all this is like the employer, the, the employee path. So I went to Jakarta, did two years there, then Singapore, did five years there, and did a year and a half in Taiwan before then coming here to the U.S. And I, it, it, a lot of it just has to do with just having a lot of fun with the with the topics that I've been able to touch through my work um, and also just being, I guess, resilient, not entitled to anything, working hard. I, I suspect we'll get into that also later on through some of my questions, but uh, <laughs> th there's a lot of swallowing your pride and then, and then just doing the hard work. Do you think that that swallowing your pride and doing the hard work is, is essential for you to keep staying in, in Silicon Valley? Do you think that's that's one of the uh, qualities that you need to have to be here? I'll tell you, man, you know, when I moved out here, there's something about this place that, that keeps you humble. I, I, I've been trying to put a finger on it. I think part of it is there's a brag culture we're, we're kind of surrounded by. So that's one that I'm clear about. Everyone you talk to seems to be doing something really cool. But, and, they, and many of them actually are. Some of them are probably making it up. Um, <laughs> but I think there's something so daunting about, you know, I, the building I work off of is called Fairchild. And Fairchild was one of the first companies that actually started Silicon Valley. Um, they were the ones that developed the early microchips. You're, when you come out here, you're surrounded by all this great history of, of, compute, of, the, of computer history that, yeah, it, it, it it swallows you up a little bit. Yeah. Mm. Cool. So that we keep it flowing. What's your first right. question? Okay. So here's my first. So this, this, uh, this podcast um, is called the art of failing up. So I'm curious to hear from Jan and I, and I'll, I'll share my own response to what is that one failure that you maybe don't or, or hardly ever talk about. <laughs> you said curveball. This is, this is a good curveball. Uh, and, and, okay. and I want to be clear. It is something that you never talk about, perhaps because it feels a little bit too embarrassing to share, shameful, perhaps. I think, and at least to one of my questions, I think it's about leadership style. Um, I think growing up in, in Central Eastern Europe, there's a certain type of a, a leader that... Um, uh, that was the predominant way of doing things, which is exactly what you can think of, you know, the oligarchs that you can uh, you can see on TV, how they behave and very brash, et cetera. 
And um, as I was, you know, in my early 20s, I was surrounded by by mostly people like, and only the only successful people uh, that I've seen around myself were these people. And what I didn't realize um, then is the way they came to success is not repeatable uh, for me or for anybody else afterwards, because it's a uh, it's a result of a bubble in time uh, where in the 90s, you know, all of the you know post-communist countries had privatization, so the state took a lot of uh, stuff away from uh, from from families, and and then in privatization, some of those families were not around or whatever, um, and the people who were, I would say, marginally better or marginally better positioned uh, to get access to financing and other things could get really, really incredibly rich, and I think they conflated that ability to do that at such a super unique um, uh, point in time with their managerial ability, right? And which is not there. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think the, the biggest failure for me is probably not seeing that. And I connected a lot to when I, when I speak about this here, uh, meaning uh, mostly in, in the Bay Area, is um, uh, I I didn't like I didn't have mentors around me that would do the things that I'm doing now, right? There's nobody nobody that I could ask like how do you do this, and therefore I made a lot of mistakes that were the kind of mistakes that are not really teaching you much. They just cost you a lot of time and money and and life, <laughs> honestly. So so the one benefit. Let's hear an example, Jan. You're you're kind of dodging the question a little bit. Let's hear an example. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I was. Uh, yeah. Th thank you for for keeping me honest. Uh, yeah. So so being <laughs> so being like pushing down people, being very direct, being like um, this is this is not mm. great and whatever, and being more negative than than not. Um, and what I, what has changed is, um, so of course, there's cultural paradigms of like where I'm, I tend to be very direct. Uh, Etc. But what has changed for me is I t I tend to focus a lot on data, right? So uh, the way the way I uh, the way I organize my teams is try to give everybody the same access to information, a framework to think about it, uh, and then autonomy to work with that information within that framework, so that um, I kind of don't have to be there. And the mm -hmm. interesting discussions uh, that we typically tend to have are around okay, so when like when somebody would make a different decision. Uh, than somebody else on the team within the same framework and with the same information, right? So, so those are interesting discussions that then are pushing us forward. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and previously, I think uh, it would be me saying, "No, this is how it should be," and and I know, and uh, because yeah. I've seen yeah. because I've seen people around me, this is how you how you run teams, and I yeah. now know that that's not the case. Yeah, there's something about the kind of culture you grow up in that is so hard to shake off. Um, I've had a similar experience, just I, I I grew up in a very indirect communication culture and learning how to be kind of maybe coming from the opposite side of that spectrum that you're talking about, mm -hmm. learning how to how to say what I want. Literally from the opposite side of the planet. That's right. That's right. Um, okay, so let me share with you my answer to this question on failure. The, the one thing that I hardly, in fact, it, it was so shameful that I almost didn't tell my my collaborators that we had shelved the project was straight out of grad school. I had I had attempted to build this nonprofit effort um, to connect the Filipino diaspora that was outside of the Philippines with public high school students in the Philippines. Very noble cause. We were mostly idealistic and very low on technical ability. We had Microsoft at some point in in kind of gave us some software engineering resources. And so we built this platform. It was pretty basic. Um, we worked closely with a public school in the Philippines. Um, and it was like this, I think, 10 week or, or 15 week mentoring process with curriculum and all that. Um, it went so poorly, partly because the tech, I did not put in enough time to do like proper user testing for the tech. This was, by the way, like in 2011, thereabouts, 2010, 2011. But I think the bigger lesson for me was like, was I was just doing way too much. I was not committed to any one big thing. The moment the consulting job kicked in and it was incredibly demanding, 
um, the first thing to go was this was this nonprofit project. Um, I don't talk very openly about that because it felt very exciting when we were going into it. And then I felt so crushed that we weren't able to see it through. Um, but yeah, there's my uh, failure story. <laughs> and and it was that uh, was that because you prioritized the uh, the the career over this, or why is it a failure? The career, the career, and the I guess the, the career that paid that paid money. Um, I there were frustrations with working with the public school sector in the Philippines too. I I, I realized that I was maybe more in it for the the vanity of it that I could mm -hmm. say I started, you know, a nonprofit and it was for all these good reasons and all these idealistic goals. And, and I realized my, my motivations weren't deep enough mm -hmm. to get me through the harder, the harder periods of that. So I, I should one... have hired you plus if you were around at that time. Perfect. Yes. That's the lesson learned from today. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's just one, one more follow up. Uh, is there, has this experience changed how you make decisions about what projects you say yes to? So it has. Um, I'm learning that. So I still do a lot of projects. Um, I enjoy. I'm. I've learned that I care. Like I'm a very variety seeking uh, kind of professional. Um, but I've learned that there needs to be alignment between all the many things. So whether it's teaching at Stanford or. Um, or doing this work with startups or doing my core role, all of that aligns to a very similar topic area of kind of human behavior in organizational settings and how do you get mm -hmm. people to lead better, more effectively. So it all, it all aligns. And so you're not doing five things at 500%. You're, you're kind of doing five things at like 150%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that's a good segue to, um, to, to my next question. Uh, which is, and I think it's maybe if you can give, give a little bit more context about the book that you're writing, that's based on your uh, work. Uh, but the question is yeah. kind of to your, to, 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 to what you asked, what was the, my biggest failure? Like what is the most effective way of leading a company uh, for, or leading a, a new venture also in, in, inside of like a larger organization? And how does it differ? The, the, the oral question is to me, how does it differ from, from stage to stage when you're very early on, Versus when you're later stage, when you have when you have team, um, yeah, you know, the, it's probably different, and I'm and I'm sure that you're covering a lot of that in, in what you're what you're doing day to day. Yeah, no, that's really good. So so let let me um, so we've collected data, and so I'm, let me tell you what we've seen in the data, and then let me tell you on top of that what my hypothesis is that I cannot yet support with mm -hmm. data. Um, so so we've over the past maybe eight years, worked with a few thousand founders around the world. I think now it's in about 70 countries. Um, and along the way, we've, we've done what, you know, what, what org development folks call, or initial development folks call 360 degree feedback um, mm -hmm. surveys. So we asked a, founders, a founder to, to, to assess themselves on, on a few things, their co-founders, their employees, their investors, their board, board members to, to then do the same. And you can easily compare, like you know, between um, between how a founder sees themselves and how others see them. There's some really interesting analytics there. But to the question, on, like what, like what is the most important thing in leading a company, and how does that change over time? So the most important thing, and this is something that I think doesn't change over time. What we saw from the data, which which as as a as someone who cares about the research, I was a little bit disappointed because it wasn't the most novel discovery, but it was by far the most um, the most predictive factor to to being effective as a as a leader was this idea that we that we that we call um, treating people like volunteers. It's it's kind of this mindset leaders have that starts with good people have options and my best people don't have to be here mm -hmm. um, and they can walk away at any time. And so if you begin with that premise, the way you operate with your team changes quite materially. Um, what I pay them is not a justification for uh, kind of treating them poorly. Um, and instead I want to figure out how do we give them work 
that not only meets the goals of the organization, but also meets their own personal goals. And if you can find that kind of that overlap of the Venn diagram, um, essentially magic happens, right? You get the, and, and we know that, you know, your top people who have found this kind of that Venn diagram um, will be a lot more productive than people who are just there because it's just a job. Mm -hmm. um, and so you want to find that sweet spot and you want to treat them that way. In some ways I've shared in the past that I think nonprofits are a great or volunteer organizations are a great place to learn leadership because you literally don't have any money to give them or promotions or anything else. Really all you have is the mission. And if you can, if you can get people to understand how meaningful the mission is and then connect that to their own personal interests and goals, um, you'll be gold. That doesn't change, by the way, whether you are working in a garage without any money to literally pay nothing to people, all the way up to being in a big organization where you do have you know, world-class compensation to pay. Like the same premise actually leads to really the best kind of leadership I've seen. Um, I think things do change um, as you go through um, stages of development or stages of growth. The most important thing has to do with the level of complexity an organization starts to have as they get bigger. It's a really good book called The Founder's Mentality. And, and the thesis of that book is the following. Um, growth creates complexity and the silent killer of, of growth, sorry, growth creates complexity and the silent killer um, of growth um, is, that, is that same complexity. Um, and the idea is that as a leader, at the beginning, as a founder, you almost have to deal with very little complex. You have one product, maybe one market, um, and really nothing, nothing more than that. The moment you start expanding to other markets, you have people in different geographies, you have multiple product lines, and you have, you know, at this point, thousands of, of employees. Trying to be the person that helps simplify the internal operations is so important later on um, mm -hmm. as you grow. That complexity could really kill um, any f potential for future growth. That's I think that's super in insightful. Does this change um, the volunteer mentality? Because what I'm taking away from when you said volunteer mentality is really good, um, sort of approximation. But then you talked about vision and, and mission, nor kind of setting north star for the team, so they can you know when you're in a volunteer organization, you have no title, you have no inherent authority other than you you are there for a reason as everybody else right so um are in your research have you found or in working with uh with founders have you found that there's a, a significant or meaningful difference in working with i don't know a german an italian a filipino an australian in in how to motivate them yeah you know so the, the trick is you you want to actually meet the individual where they're at. Um, now, do, do, do people's motivations cluster based on kind of where they grew up? Um, we don't have enough data to say anything like that conclusively. However, I have seen global data sets that look at leadership styles um, that are effective across different parts of the world. Um, and for the most part, this idea of, you, of figuring out how to use an inspirational style of leadership actually seems to travel quite uh, um, quite globally mm -hmm. with some nuances, right? Um, there is a sense that in more Western cultures, um, employees love to look at leaders who are a lot more, uh, I guess, like vocally inspirational, people who can actually bring their rhetoric to the fore. And they care a lot about good storytelling and um, and a compelling, you know, a compelling narrative. Um, I think that's less pronounced in other parts of the world. And so a lot of it, um, when you look at, for example, more Japanese or, or Chinese kind of uh, personas um, who are successful CEOs, like they tend to be a lot more about, like, there's a more collective, more like, let's get the work done, let's be, let's be focused and there's a lot less of the of the theatrics, if you will, that come with mm -hmm. more Western style leadership. Um, th there's one quick thing I want to say that I think is pretty surprising. So, so there was some research recently around humility and leaders, and whether or not 
humility actually predicts effective leadership. And that actually seems to travel also globally. Um, mm -hmm. There were studies done in America and studies done in China, and they saw exactly this, that you can have a hubristic CEO and their, and their effectiveness will be here. You can have just a humble CEO and their effectiveness will be a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But then there was this interesting combination of the, of the, of the humble, confident leader that actually tends to be more effective than those first two. Mm. Um, so there, there are things about the human condition that just doesn't change because of culture. And then there's some of these more, more, uh, more nuanced things. Thank you. Thank you for the thought. Faisal, thank you for the, for the questions. Everybody, feel free to, to post the questions in the chat where we can see those and we can get to them in, in about 15 minutes. Um, so Martin, what, are your what is your second question? All right. Um, so the last time we chatted in San Francisco, you actually brought um, you brought up this. I, the, you showed me a post on LinkedIn about Martech's law. I don't know if you remember this. Yep. yep. Um, essentially, Martech's law for for the listeners um, asks the question: Why is it that we can have such incredible technology, but adoption is pretty is pretty sparse? Um, it's it, 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 it essentially assumes two things. One, that tech innovation is exponential, but then organizational change or, or the ability for the org to adopt that is linear. Um, and so you'll see this ever widening gap between technology and, um, and the human ability to, to adopt it. Um, so I guess you see this a lot in your work, I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, what is the best hack in solving for that? And I ask it because Ooh. I'm also trying to figure that out myself. And by the way, like, I think what a really, a really cool spin on that is with all the fear mongering around AI, mm -hmm. this idea that people are <laughs> slow to adapt new technology could just be the saving grace of the moment where right. we can actually, it's a bit of an immune system against some of these technologies that may maybe have second, third order effects if we're not yet aware of. But anyway, back to the question of like, what's the hack to that? How do you how do you hack that? Um, it's a good question. Before before I answer it, I remember I think 2019 or something like that. 2018, I went to San Francisco in in April, and then I went back to Europe, and I came back in June, and in and in April, there were no scooters. Uh, on the streets. And in June, it was filled with lime uh, and bird scooters. Uh, so I think it, it kind of differs on, on where you are. And I think we're, we're, we live in a massive bubble. And what I see now uh, is, of course, organizations here, opening eyes here. So Hayes Valley got renamed to Cerebral Valley, right? Because because of this. Uh, so people are coming back. So so they're di probably there, I would say there are different um, uh, like the holes in the sponge of how people can sort of uh, ingest all the information is, is different. What is the hack? Um, I I think. Well, I can I can tell you I can I can tell you how 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 we're having the discussion right now, right? Uh, yeah. I think my my hack for this, and we'll see if it if it works, but. Um, to to have somebody who's running in front of the company a little bit more and tries to maybe actively disrupt it um, or tries to actively see what is it that you can do with all these new technologies that would that would if you project it in the future how the, how the how they change the company right and then you can also disrupt the company at at the same time because it would you, you would lose yeah. the ability to even have that discussion in the first place right so. Right. To me, the answer is kind of two teams. Um, at least that's what we're mm. that's what we're kind of doing right now, and uh, and and at one point in the future, um, it, it flips or there's like a step change, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, I I love that thought because when I look at when I look at all the case studies of really successful change, but and by the way, there aren't a lot. Like there aren't a lot of truly like orgs that have truly transformed from within. There are very few if you held the bar high. Um, but I think you're right. I think the what I've seen more more of the time is 
the CEO understands that we need to segment out a unit of the company, pr- protect it from the big kind of corporate machinery, give them autonomy to then explore and do their thing. And then over time, readopt it to your point. Um, one of the banks I loved backing with when I was living in Singapore is DBS. DBS was a, they were like the fisherman's bank. Like they were maybe 50 years old, as old as Singapore was. They were the state bank. They were they were really behind. Today, they are maybe the, the, the gold standard for digital banking. And it was, I walked into their branch maybe once to open an account and never in the five years I was, ne- never again in the five years I was there. Um, and this guy, he was a former Citibank guy. Um, he did exactly this. There was a floor in the building and you could see kind of p- when people shuffle into the elevator, you have the bankers and their suits and all. And then you have the people in at that floor who were building the digital bank and they were, you know, in their t-shirts and their jeans and, and it was a different environment there. And I think you're right. I, I, the thing I would I would nuance to your answer is that I think there's also an issue with how technology I think is is built. I think there there are there there are products that are more easily adapted, like the Lime scooters, because they they mold into the human behavior that exists today. Um, and then there are others that just aren't that that mm-hmm. good at getting adoption. So I think there there's probably a the tech and the, and the humans involved are both at fault. I... Makes sense. Uh, we're 30 minutes in. Let's go. This, let's go to my, to my favorite curveball question for you. Okay. So with, uh, we have the emergence of generative AI, at least in the past, uh, past cup, you know, past year, uh, that's, that's what we see, see the boom. Uh, I, I, for one thing, it's, it's the, the greatest increase in human productivity ever. Um, and we're still going to have to discover what what that means, uh, yeah. and and we're at the footsteps of the mountain, uh, I would say right now. So, with that in mind, what is the role of human talent for businesses going uh, going to the future? <laughs> yeah, you you know what I'll tell you. What is the most unsatisfying answer to that question? It's when people <laughs> say, therefore human empathy and creativity and curiosity, like all of that, the human mm-hmm. touch, like all of that is therefore the most important solve for humans to not be obsolete. And therefore everyone pick up a liberal arts degree or, and I should say that was my undergrad. I have a liberal arts undergrad, <laughs> so I'm not hating on liberal arts uh, majors. The reason why that's unsatisfying is because I suspect at some point computers will be able to do all of that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, okay, but, but I'm, but that comment is probably more a 20 year out comment, maybe mm-hmm. not, you know, a two year out comment. Um, so I think, I think the role, so I think there are jobs that will not get, get kind of, won't, you won't get outsourced fully to a machine or to an AI. Um, and I think those those jobs particularly now have to do with the fact that there's a lot of interesting research around algorithm aversion bias. It's essentially this idea that we've been we've evolved through the millennia to really to really need need certain human very human cues. For example, when I when I speak to you, Jan, depending on your posture, the way you speak, your eye contact. I can kind of subconsciously suss out your level of competence, your level, at least your mm-hmm. level of confidence. Mm-hmm. Um, with machines, like you, you don't have that variation. Um, in fact, you know, these large language models, they'll respond to you very confidently, even if they're wrong. Like, and they will confidently lie to you, yeah. They, that's right. And, and so there are certain things that, so take for example, um, when AI comes to help doctors, Many of the founders I speak to who have this technology, they're very clear that you cannot over, you need to give the physician a certain amount of liberty to actually override them. Even if we know that the, that the, that the error rate is so much higher if we leave it to the human doctors to do the work. Um, Why do you think that is though? Because on, you know, if you just lay it out like this, it's just, we shouldn't, right? So why does it make us more comfortable? Because 
because it's about our need for control. It, 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 it's it, some people have called it the agentic preference. We, we much prefer having agency over something than not having agency. So a lot of the research around how to hack algorithm aversion bias, um, this this work was done out of Wharton. They actually gave um, the human users of the of the algorithm slight amounts of tweaks that they can do. They can tweak it up or down. I can't remember now if it was like 5% more or less. Essentially, you're actually, you could actually tweak it and make the error rate worse. But in exchange of giving people that, that, that level of, of um, control, the adoption rates were a lot higher. Um, and so if you can cater somehow, you can, you know, to people's sense, their need for control. You might then ask the next level question of like, why do we even need like, why would we trust our level of um, our, our, our error rate compared to a computer's error rate? So one of the, the researchers in that space concluded something pretty interesting. He said that um, with machines, error rates are known and they're pretty firm and you can improve on it, yes, but they're, but they're known. But my error rate as a human being, um, while it's known, I have a sense, maybe a delusion that I'm perfectible mm-hmm. and that I can actually mm-hmm. close that gap almost fully, um, which is which is hubris and, and nonsense, right? But that's the human condition for you. Um, mm-hmm. So I think, I think coming back a little bit to the question of, well, what does that leave humans to do? I think there's a lot of work still to be done around how do we actually get back to the Martex law? How do we get adoption up? How do we, how do we get these machines to explain themselves better. And sometimes the machines themselves can be built to be more explainable, but I think there needs to be a human interface between kind of machine and human to help that translation point. So I think there will be a lot of that, whether it's in whatever profession you find yourself in. So you think the next 20 years look like that, that we're trying to see how to best merge the AI intelligence with the human intelligence. Um, and that's gonna be the narrative. Perhaps, and look, I'm not a technologist myself, so you should actually not believe what I'm about to say. Um, <laughs> I have been trying, I have actually been trying to filter where I, I've been trying to come to a point, a good point of view around this. And whenever I hear someone opine about technology, I want to first check how close they are to the tech. Because mm-hmm. a lot of people aren't close to the tech. They opine about it. Then you ask them, oh, so have you tried ChatGPT or Bard? And it's like, well, I've been meaning to, I'm like, well, why do you have an opinion about this if you haven't right. even tried it? Um, right. So, um, look, I, I think there's a, there's a possible future where um, everything that humans do can be outsourced to machines. That's, that's essentially possible. But, it, but I think looking at history could be educational for us, right? There was a time when... Um, People thought that you know we would we had reached the peak of human kind of uh, utility uh, because of the industrial revolution, and somehow we managed to create something completely new out of that. Um, there was a time when 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 social media was coming up, up they were saying, "Look, like we no longer need uh, the world will be a smaller place. You no longer need actual in person." you know, experiences, like a lot of this can be done online. And actually the world is a much more fragment, fragmented place as a result. So I, mm-hmm. so I think there's a lot of hype right now around this AI technology. It could be incredibly transformative, but it could be also incredibly like full of a lot of hype. So I'm trying to be a little bit more level-headed about what could be possible. That might mean I'm a late adopter, but you know, look, I've been writing this book and um, chat GPT and Bard have been incredibly useful for me as I go about it. Perfect. Um, just, uh, just be mindful of, uh, to be mindful of time. Let's do, let's do quickly your last question. And then we have a bunch of questions and comments yeah. that we should probably get to. Okay. And we could do like a, th- this could be maybe a, a quicker answer. Um, I just like asking people who I regard as successful and really productive. Like what are some of your productivity hacks? What are some of the, daily, weekly, monthly habits you've put in place to be productive. Right. Okay. So I have two, three co- very concrete things. One of them okay. is is ultra weird and I haven't seen anybody else anybody else do it. I've gone through so many different to-dos, like to-do list manager apps. And what I ultimately use is a mind map. 
uh, because I am the kind of person that also likes to, you know, check check uh, the box when I've done things. And yeah. uh, what I found, it makes me I give I get endorphins from that for some reason. Um, <laughs> Wait, but so, when you say mind map, it's this nonlinear kind of spider web yeah, yeah. kind of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so, so there's a there's a tool that I use called Mind Mind Node. It's uh, unfortunately yeah. it's only on on Macs and iPhones, and that's that I'm actively trying to replace it with something else. But essentially, uh, my issue was like I needed to send for like to to show it some something. I needed to send an email uh, to a customer. To be able to send that email, I need to go to my team. I need to update something on the website. I need to put together a, a, a deck. And for that deck, there's like a series of other things. So it's just like it's just, it spirals into I need from I need to send an email to it took two hours, right? And after two hours, like I send an email, good job, right? So um, for me, oh, it was how, how, how do I break it up so that I understand what, what goes into it and also can be happy about actually doing it? Yeah. Uh, and I've been using for the past, I guess, two, two years, uh, two, three years, something like that. I haven't found a better solution. So that's that's one thing. The other thing is in 2019, I got a personal trainer. And the reason was because I, I bought the whole company and knew that it was going to be incredibly mentally challenging. And um, that's the first time that I actually focused on my physical health. And I found that uh, even, although it gives me the benefit, the physical benefits health, what I what I really take from going to the gym mm -hmm. almost every day at spending an hour there is that my my brain switches off uh, from uh, and ideally the personal trainer is mm. there's somebody else telling me what I should do and I can forget about everything else and that value yeah. is that value for me is is big and um, I don't have a trainer now but I do but I do go every day uh, every 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 weekday so so that's something that I kept up and then. Hmm. Um, I, the, 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 other thing is, is kind of, you can read about it. I kind of switched all of the notifications off. I, the only notifications that I have are, you know, uh, I message or signal, uh, so my friends were messaging me as, as I was, as we were talking here because I didn't turn on do not disturb. So that's the only thing that, um, uh, that uh, I, that I do have. And then treat, treat, treatment of emails, right. I'm, um, I use superhuman, um, and, uh, the, the main reason for that, that yeah i think the main reason for that is i try to get through my emails once in the morning i don't really look at them uh whatever i can answer quickly i answer quickly if it's like a mailing list with like with generative ai now i'm on so many mailing lists for some reason it's like every single day i need to unsubscribe from like five otherwise it would be a mess uh, so 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 trying to it it's all it's all in service all of these things are in service of freeing up space and memory in my head so that you know if i have 80 percent of my brain capacity available for me to think about the things that i that i need to think uh, mm -hmm. think about rather than 30 percent because the, the rest of it is junk of like the task list of the things that i should do and i forgot over yeah. some so i try to put my brain into all of those places so i then don't have to um uh deal yeah. with yeah i love that okay let me throw in my quick two or three uh hacks so one is to get my deepest deep work can only happen for me at 4 a.m. before mm -hmm. I then wake up the kids at 6.30. So I, I try to get to bed early, wake up early. I also find that doing some fasting in the morning, not eating your until lunchtime, gives me great mental clarity, at least through that in, initial push day. Um, yeah, maybe those two. Perfect. So I think thanks for all these questions. I think we have a bunch of questions in comments. Can okay. you can you see them, Martin, or should I or should I yep. read them? Perfect. I, let's start from the top. I think Faisal was the um, first. I can see. That. Yeah, and I think it's more a question for you. Uh, on your note about finding the overlap between the orgs, orgs goals, and personal ambitions, um, and fangs or other or, or the likes, how would you advise ICs, not leaders, yeah. to explore? that to find that overlap yeah you know this is where a good manager could actually be useful so let, let's assume that you have a good manager um sitting down with them to understand how can the how can these projects kind of ladder up to a goal that i personally care about 
Um, or are there other projects that I can add to my plate that can then, you know, ladder up to that? The one thing I, I always tell, especially early, early career stage professionals, is it's so important to remember that there's no job in the world that is 100% really fun and exciting all the time. In fact, w- one of the best advice I got that really helped me manage my expectations is always think of a, any job in thirds. So one third is going to be incredibly fun, exhilarating rock music playing in the background as you're doing the work. And then one third of that is going to be painful. It's doing the expense reports. It's doing the stakeholder management that you don't really care about. Some people care about that. And there's a third that's kind of, man, not, you know, neither here nor there. That's a, if you can get your ratio up to that, where a third of your job is really fun and exciting and meets your goals, then that would be great. Um, yeah. All right. There's a second question from David. What advice would you give to someone who, I think I guess wants to start. He wants to start a start. Yeah. Yeah. He posted afterwards. All right. Uh, So there's a lot of advice on this, but the one thing that I have repeatedly seen founders make poor decisions on that they pay so dearly later on is choosing the right co-founder. Um, so first is, if you can found on your own, if you have the psychological and financial and relational capital to found on your own, um, that's that's probably okay. Most people will find this journey to be so treacherous that you actually want to bring you know one or two co-founders with you. But go slow on finding the right co-founder. Um, the data shows that when you co-found with family or friends, those tend to be the least stable kind of relationships. Uh, part of the reason for that is that you're going into the business um, with two relationships. There's a personal and there's a business relationship. And if you want to have a really tough conversation on the business side, the cost, if that blows up, is double than if you were just colleagues to begin with. Um, the most stable relationships are the ones that actually discover each other in a place of work, where they see each other's work ethic, they know each other's Um, styles and also their capabilities Um, and they know that it's a complement not an overlap Uh, Mm -hmm. those tend to be a lot more more stable so that that's the one thing if there's if there's anything that we look at you just reminded me of one thing that i wanted to follow up on earlier and that didn't one of the most useful exercises that i've seen this you're probably going to have it in a book but it certainly was part of the training that you did for us in sweden all those years ago and I know that it was has been a part of uh, of the Google uh, Google Launchpad now Google's um, startup Google Accelerator for Startups um, is when you have the founders and CEOs uh, CEO coaching where you have let's say four people four CEOs uh, four executives and then each one of them has an issue that they want the group to discuss but mm-hmm. the most powerful thing about that was you're in the same room you say here's my issue and then you have to turn around yeah, but you're in yeah. the same room. Right, and then yeah. the three other, or five other people, or however many, discuss candidly. It's like you know, this kind of nonsense or whatever. He should do one, two, three, right? And you have to be there, sit there, and not talk, yeah. and listen, listen to people. Yeah. Um, so I know it's not yeah. connected to the question, but th- that's one of those small tidbits that I that I remember finding super valuable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have an example of a person that is a humble, confident combo leader? I have only one, and I don't know. I don't know enough uh, to to mm-hmm. be honest. But out of all of the big tech leaders right now, to meet such an Adela, um, at least I perceive him as humble, and he's incredibly capable, um, and and a shrewd operator. So, yeah, you know, the other person I'd put on that list is Daniel Ek, and I write about him in the book. Actually, Daniel Ek is a is a Spotify founder and CEO. Um, he is so quick to say that this is my team that actually did this. Um, I disagreed about this feature, but I let them do it. And I was incredibly wrong because it was, um, it was a home run feature. Um, He defers to his, to the experts on his team and he doesn't. So there's a lot of humility there, but confident. I think that the point around confidence is you want, there are moments where your team wants you to just show them what the goal is and, feel confident in the team that you can you can pull through to get there. That's where the confidence lies. The humility lies in giving, you know, 
letting the letting your team influence your thinking um, and giving them credit uh, when it's true. Perfect Good question, Arthur. Um, and I think we have one more from Arthur. From uh, and I think Bo or David. To... Oh, it was, it oh, was sorry, just no, he, that was the previous one. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if organizational adoption is slow, I think a question is who are the types of champions that tend to spearhead innovation and change? Yes, a CEO can make a separate segment, basically start fresh, but is there another way? For example, is, uh, is it very hard with people that have worked there for 30 years versus new employees? So, so I think the challenge isn't the people, the individual person in adopting the change. It's all the systems that surround that surround it's that they report to the same people they work in the same environment they're working on the same you know product and you want them to change the way they do it um now the levels of i'm rolling out a new procurement system <laughs> i first you have to roll it out across the board for it to actually be a meaningful change but that's not the kind of change I think is difficult. I think that one is not that easy, but it's also not the most difficult version. I think when you want to kind of go for more core innovation, where it's where you almost deeply gut the way you dispense, um, the way, you know, I'll, I'll tell you my first job, I was part of an innovation team that was trying to drive like a whole new line of innovation for for my company. And the problem was that the company had been market leader or second in the market in all the categories we were putting in. And so you can imagine the kind of decision-making style that exists in the management team. It was a lot more conservative. And by the way, like the margins were super, you know, were, were super fat. Um, and so it, it was very difficult for them to make really big, bold decisions. And that's where that's where then it becomes like the struggle between the old DNA and the new DNA you're trying to create. And I actually do like to think about it in terms of DNA because when you start something new, you can almost create the DNA from you know from the get go. Whereas you know changing a, an organization's DNA is a lot more difficult to do. Yeah, makes sense. Arthur, I'm just going to skip the next one. You have a lot of questions, uh, just to, so we get in this in the seven minutes to the other others. From John, um, there are defining moments in the development of economies, the industrial revolution, the internet and AI. I believe that many companies are struggling to look at what AI technologies they need to adopt and how they're going to do it. Business fit, scalability, et cetera. How can these large companies quickly validate business cases for the use of AI? I feel like this is a question for you, Jan. Yeah, um, I kind of have the same answer as I had before, right? It's just... Uh, uh, the, the, so maybe let's let's let, let, let's take one step back what this is like i'll, I'll compare it and i don't want to want to be mean to blockchain but um, if i compare this to the hype around blockchain the hype around generative ai blockchain is a database and that's what it is right so by some features of that it enables new business cases that are potentially and arguably in, in very few sec sectors, uh, like finance and supply chain, are right, the two the two that are obvious, uh, enables new things. And that's kind of where I would leave it. And then everything else is fluff, at least to me. That's just a personal opinion. With mm -hmm. generative AI, the issue is um, it is so, it, it took the world by storm and it's so far, uh, so, 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 it's more advanced than we thought. And I think, and I would argue that 99% of people have, haven't have explored the limits of it. And I've been yeah. playing around with it for, for like four months. And only like this week, I found uh, the problem of where it loses context around so token space, memory, et cetera. It's like, and those are concepts that only you will know when you, when you like spend hours with it. Yeah. And, and uh, unlike blockchain, uh, as an example, this is applicable across any sort of process improvement. So I think what this requires and the best, I, I, I was uh, in Austin over the weekend and, and I met with a friend of mine, Dustin, who's the Google Cloud field CTO. And we were 
we're talking about it. And then working with this, it kind of requires you to be both a technical person as well as a subject matter expert to get the most out of this. So yeah. Um, or you need to do almost like pair programming on trying to find out what the best prompt is. And yeah. uh, and and the challenge that I'm, that I'm kind of getting to is you can implement this anywhere, right? So the so then it's not where where should it be, but like how quickly and what's the level of fidelity, right? Yeah. So it's 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 going to happen, right? So uh, what are the limitations of the current systems, and uh, I think the most daunting, at least for me, uh, uh, point of view on this is like every single model, a GPT-3 versus GPT-4 versus whatever Bard or or I think it's Llama from, from Facebook, if, if, I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, they will have different answers given the same prompt. And if, uh, and if you start building your system around one of these, and then, you know, if you upgrade from GPT-4 to GPT-5 or something like that, it will all break. So, so you kind of need to do it again. So, I think this is this is going to be a process of self disruption, um, like it's never been done before anywhere. You can, and across all of the departments of any company, right? Yeah. So, then the question is, do you need that person that runs ahead of everybody? Um, for example, in our company, I'm I'm trying like I'm sending this stuff every single day to someone. It's like, hey, here's how you can use it. Here's how we should use it uh, in in different places. Um, and my hope is at, a, at one point, it won't be me. Somebody will come back and say, hey, here's how I've used it, right? And here's how I can implement it in our workflow. And I think the first mm -hmm. step is going to be just shortening the workflows that you have internally in the companies as you discover how to mm -hmm. use this better. Mm -hmm. um, That's a good answer. Hey, in the interest of time, I, I was looking through the questions. Uh, let mm -hmm. me pull out Andy's question and we can do a rapid fire response to it. So I love the term agentic preference. How do you see that affecting big ideas failing to get the appropriate decision makers in organizational hierarchy? All right. Um, so as you can tell, yes, like giving people a sense of control over over things is so important. You know, I my hack with my kids, for instance, if they don't want to brush their teeth, my my question isn't. I don't say brush your teeth. I say, do you want to brush your teeth in five minutes or ten minutes? Um, and somehow, just by giving them a choice, they're already game to do the task. Um, there's some interesting research out of Harvard Business School by Michael Norton around what, what he's coined the IKEA effect. And essentially the idea is that when people put a, a certain amount of labor into a project, there's suddenly a lot more preference for it. Um, said differently, um, involvement creates commitment. And so that's almost the, the thing that I always advise leaders to figure out ways that they can involve their, their teams in in the decision making and in, in doing you know the validation process and in the in the process of involving them getting these big ideas to land well with the team is so much easier at that point what you don't want is a big launch a big reveal and hope that people adopt the change perfect and i think we have two more minutes and i think this is a perfect okay. question for the last two more minutes from rahul any specific leadership book or concept that appeals to you more and you find use you find it useful in your day-to-day -day work uh that's really great um you know i don't read a lot of leadership books at least not recently maybe because in my field i've realized that a lot of it just isn't super robust stuff um i tend to like going with academics who write good popular books because i feel like there's a lot more rigor to the way they think about Things. So things by Adam Grant, I find to be um, really, really good. Um, there's a really good book that has shaped my thinking called Collective Genius by, um, by Linda Hill from Harvard, if I'm not mistaken. Really fascinating qualitative study uh, on the most innovative places um, in the world. Um, I'd say those two books. Mm -hmm. I'd add, I always recommend two books. Uh, one of them is Extreme Ownership and the other one is uh, Pyramid Principle. And uh, Extreme Ownership is former SEAL, uh, SEAL uh, duo that have a business consultancy and they kind of approach, they always give an example, this is what happened when we're in war, this is what happens in business, and here's the, the, here's the lesson. Um, and the, it the the message is very clear you need to own up to your own mistakes even if those are mistakes of your team or somebody else and that's the kind of most useful 
framework of thinking about things. And I know I drive our teams sometimes insane and saying, yeah, but this is our problem, <laughs> right? And they're like, yeah, but one, two, three. And it's like, no, it's like, we, we have to manage, we have to, uh, we have to manage it and we have to accept it. And the apartment principle is, is a book by Barbara Minto, who was the first, um, uh, McKinsey partner, I think first female McKinsey partner, and she rose to uh, to that level by super effective communication. And yeah. this is a way of communicating really, really well. And I found that find that especially if you have like U plus is twenty five different nationalities, we're split between twelve time zones, um, we're mostly remote. Effective communication is the biggest. Uh, uh, I would say predictor of a team's. Um, ability to execute. Uh, so learning how to do this in a remote environment and be really concise, but get your point across is, 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 is key. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Amazing. I think we That's a good book. ran yeah. out of time. Thank you, yeah, Ma Martin. Thank you, everybody, for asking the questions. This was super fun. Uh, we're looking, this is the first time we've done it, uh, guys. This is, uh, if, if you have any feedback for us, please I give us feedback. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for finding time. Um, I know we have people from the Middle East. So in your evening, thanks for people in the in California, you know, waking up early um, to to listen to us and you and choosing to um, spend spend this time with us. And thank you, Martin, for agreeing to this. This is this has been great. This is fun. Good to see you, Jan. Good to see you, Martin. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Thursday. Bye bye. Take care. Bye.